Okay. The t sermon today, message today, is going to be, what is the story of Elisha and a um, Shunammite woman? Um, the older I get, I wrote this in my notes because I thought about it, the more I often wonder what kind of mark I will leave in this world. Everyone leaves a mark, whether it's good, bad, or unnoticed. You still leave a mark. You cannot live a life and not leave a mark. When we're dead and gone, will it make any difference? Will it make any difference how we've lived on this earth? What, if anything, I have done for the Lord? We all ask that question. I'm not telling you anything you have not asked yourself. Not one of you. We all wonder about what will be said about us. <laughs> I thought my wife forgot, but I, I asked that um, when I go that she arranged for Pop Goes the Weasel to be played as they carry me out. <laughs> I just want to get people on edge a little bit to watch. So if you're there and they play it, I'm probably not going to come out. But you don't know. It will. it will. Our text takes place 850 B.C. And that becomes important because culturally we have to look at what was going on. We're going to look at a woman who is nameless. Nameless. There's not a name mentioned in the Bible. Only person that knows her name that's alive today is God. Her family knew her. Her friends knew her. The ones that cared about her knew it. I'm doubting that she would care that we at St. John's or anyone else in 2024 does not know her name. I'm doubting if she would care one bit. She's uh, the Shumanite woman. We'll just have to wait till we get to heaven to be with her to know her name. And what was this woman's great deed? What was this woman's great mission, this passion, that left a mark so wide that we're talking about it thousands of years later, had to be something wonderful and fantastic and great, right? She was simply willing to give comfort to a man of God. That was it. That was her sole claim to glory. She didn't do it for personal praise or for glory or wealth. She didn't do it to be rewarded. She acted out of her love for God. That's all she did. She didn't make the front page of the Blackshear Times. She didn't make Channel 4 News. I don't know, it doesn't tell us, but I don't think anybody in the community really knew or cared that she had given comfort to this man of God. God cared. Cared a whole lot. I think sometimes... I suffer from this. I struggle because I think surface has to be so much more than I'm giving. I think obeying God has to be so much more complete than I do. I think sometimes in the terms of saving a human life, that's a pretty good feat. I've done it a couple times. I think if you're looking for that type of thing constantly, you're going to be constantly disappointed. I probably cost more lives than I save. No one is praising us, so we feel like what we're doing isn't worthwhile. No one was praising that Shumanite woman. The locals, she had to get permission from her husband. He wasn't the one to come up with it. She did. But her story was great enough for God to tell the story in his scriptures. All scriptures inspired by the breath of God. This come out of God's mouth. Her act of service and providing comfort for a man of God. So what's your story going to be? What's my story going to be? If your neighbor is sick and needs a hot meal, you really don't have to tell anyone. You take them a meal. You help comfort them. If you know a poor family and the kids need shoes, winter coat, get them what they need. We don't have to make a production out of it. We talked earlier about Pam with the love offering. 
Love offerings are good. Church contributions are good, are good too. But you know, this woman didn't go to anybody except her husband for permission to provide what was needed. But I'm going to tell you one of the most important gifts you can give, one that I've given, probably not given enough. If you know of someone going through some rough times, tough times, one of the greatest gifts you can possibly give any human being is the gift of your presence. Simply being there for them. You don't have to have wise words. I've sat with, several times, the widows of suicide. I didn't have words. I couldn't explain it. I couldn't discuss it. I couldn't give them some theology. All I could do was sit there by their side, hold their hand, and pray. All I could do was just be there for them so they weren't alone. That's one of the greatest gifts you can give, and God recognizes it. See, no one else may notice it, but God does. This is the kind of service that God wants from each of us. He doesn't call that we go out here and change the world. He doesn't call that we go out here and put out fires, save lives. He doesn't call that we do any of those things. Matthew 25, 31 through 40. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we feed you, or thirsty, or give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, needing clothes or clothing? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? This is important. The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So every act that you do, whether or not people notice it, you do for God. You do for Jesus Christ when you do it for the least. I think sometimes we forget that. Or sometimes we want to take credit for being, well, I'm extra good, I did this or that. That's not the attitude that gets you God's attention. If the Shumanite woman would have ran around talking about how she really did all this for this man of God, that would have been the end of the story for her and probably the end of the blessings. We read in 2 Kings this amazing story, 2 Kings 4, and I'm going to start with verse 8 and go through 37. And it's titled, The Shumanite's Son Restored to Life. One day, Elisha went to Shunan, Shumen, and a well-to-do woman there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. She said to her husband, I know that this man who often comes by uh, on our way is a holy man. Let us make a small room for him on the roof and put in it a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Then he can stay there whenever he comes to us. That was her comfort that she gave. She fed him. She gave him a place to lay down, a place out of the elements, a place he could rest. That was her great service that we're talking about thousands of years later. The woman is described as wealthy. There's some debate over that. Um, I read different things, but the Greek word used for great meant wealthy in this context, I believe. She was married, she lived in a village, they had servants, they had property, they had livestock, so she would be wealthy by their standards, probably wealthy by ours. 
So going on with 2 Kings 4, 11 through 13 this time. One day when Elisha uh, came, he went up to his room and lay down there. He said to his servant, Jehazi. That's a strange name, Jehazi. But call a Shumanite. So he called her and she stood before him. Elisha said to him, tell her you have gone to all this trouble for us. Now what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? Here's what she replied when asked what she wanted. She didn't want anything. She replied, I have a home among my own people. She was thanking God she had a home among her own people. She was perfectly content. She didn't need anything else. Second Kings 4, 14 through 16. What can be done for her, Elijah asked. She has, I said, she has no son and her husband is old. Then Elijah said, call her. So he called her and she stood in the doorway. About this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. No, my Lord, she objected. Please, man of God, don't mislead your servant. This promise was more than she could even begin to believe. This prophecy was fulfilled. You had to have a son in that age, in that culture, to have worth as a woman. Women were treated different. Having a son was a major part of it. Second Kings um, 17, then through 37. But the woman became pregnant, and the next year, about that same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elijah had told her. The child grew, and one day he went out to his father, who was with the reapers. He said to his father, my head, my head. His father told a servant, carry him to his mother. After a servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. So here's this elderly woman with a son. She'd been promised, cradling this child as he died. She went up, laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and went out. Her faith was not hurt yet. She called her husband and said, please send me one of the servants and a donkey so I can go quick, so I can go to the man of God quickly and return. The husband says, why go to him today? He asked, it's not the new moon or the Sabbath. That's all right, she said. That's all she said. Send me a servant and a donkey. She saddled a donkey and said to her servant, lean on and don't slow down for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the um, a man of God at Mount Carmel. When he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to his servant, she has I, look, there's the Shumanite. Run to meet her and ask her, are you all right? Is her husband all right? Is your child all right? When the servant got there, she replied, everything is all right. And this is a woman who just traveled on a donkey quickly who held her dying son, and he passed, but everything was all right. She had an inner peace that undescribable. <coughs> when she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. Jehazi came over to push her away, but the man of God said, leave her alone. She is in bitter distress, but the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. She goes on to talking to Elijah. Did I ask you for a son, my Lord? She, she said, didn't I tell you don't raise my hopes? Elijah said to Jehazi, tuck your cloak into your belt and take my staff in your hand and run. Don't greet anyone you meet, and if anyone greets you, do not answer. Lay my staff on the boy's face. But the child's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you, talking to Elijah. So he got up and followed her. Jehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face, but there was no sound or response. So Jehazi went back to meet Elisha and told him, the boy has not awakened. When Elisha reached the house, 
there was the dead boy laying on his couch. He went in, shut the door on the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lay on the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hand to hand, and stretched himself out on him, and the boy's body grew warm. Elijah turned away and walked back and forth in the room, and then got on the bed and stretched out um, on him once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Elisha summoned Jehazi and said, Call the Shumanite. And he did. And when she came, he said, Take your son. She came in and fell at his feet and bowed to the ground. Then she took her son and went out. Now what was this woman's great deed again? She gave comfort to a man of God. She gave him a place to lay down. Now, she was not only given a son, she was restored that son. It's not the end of the story. I'm about halfway through it. Later, in 2 Kings, chapter 8, verse 1, we read, Now Elijah had said to the woman whose son he had restored to life, Arise and depart with your household and sojourn wherever you can. For the Lord has called a famine, and it will come upon the land for seven years. So she left. She took her family, and they left for seven years. After seven years, they returned. But when she returned, she discovered that she had lost everything they had. Her land, possession, house, everything was gone. She had been deemed as abandoning in her property by the government. And our government sometimes operates that way. But she'd been deemed for abandoning her property. But yet God wasn't through yet. 2 Kings 8, 3 through 6. After the famine ended, she returned from the land of Philistines. And she went to see the king about getting her house and land. Getting back her house and land. As she came in, the king was talking to Jehazi the servant of the man of God. The king had just said, tell me some stories about the great things Elijah has done. And Jehazi was telling the king about the time Elijah had brought a boy back to life. At that very moment, the mother of the boy walked in to make her appeal to the king about her house and land. At that very moment, God's timing is always perfect. Look, my lord, the king, Jehazi exclaimed, here is the woman now, and this is her son, the very one Elijah brought back to life. Is this true, the king asked her, and she told him the story. So he directed one of his officials to see that everything she had lost was restored to her, including the value of any crops that had been harvested during her absence. That's the story of Elijah and the Shumanite woman. Her heartfelt hospitality, her sincere faith, all through these amazing events. Now, who was blessed? Elijah was blessed. Elijah was blessed. God abundantly blessed the woman's life during a very difficult time. This tale of service is still as real today as it was then and will be for eternity. God today often uses people's humble acts, humble acts, to bless both the giver and the receiver. Earlier, we made a church decision to do a humble act. We may each individually decide to make humble acts. We don't need to tell people. We don't need to brag on it. All we need to do is do what God leads us to do. And I didn't know that was going to come up when I wrote this message. I had no clue. Did I mention God's timing is always perfect? No matter what the end results, no matter the income, live or die, if her son would have stayed dead, she wasn't going to leave God. He'd sent back his servant to lay the staff on the boy, but she did not go. She stayed with Elisha. She wanted him to go. She was there. She knew the man of God would be used by God. 
We've known people who's been faced with tragedy, and they turn to God. They pray, and they pray, and they pray. Others pray. But yet it doesn't work out the way they want it to. I was thinking of Matthew when I wrote that. It doesn't turn out the way they want it to. What I want more than anything is to say we prayed and prayed and prayed and God answered that prayer the way we wanted it to, the way we wanted him to. I will not turn from God. I will not blame God. I will not turn my back on God. What God does with Matthew is God's business. God hears and answers our prayers. It's not that he does not answer our prayers. Sometimes he doesn't answer them the way we want them answered. Sometimes we don't understand the answer. That doesn't mean God is punishing us. It just means that we're pretty fragile, mentally, physically. We don't understand. There's no way for us to know the mind of God. We can know characteristics of God. We can know his love, we can know his grace, we can know many things about God. But we cannot know the inner thinkings of God. The angels don't know. His will is for a greater purpose than we can see. His will for Matthew, for each of your lives, for each event that happens is greater than we can possibly know. No matter the outcome, come, no matter how things turn out, we've got to always praise God. Always. We cannot stop praising God. We have to praise God because he promised he will never leave us. He won't. Deuteronomy 31.6 so be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not panic before them. For the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail nor abandon you. That's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We have this story. This morning I found another story. And it's probably going to be in the sermon of a message. I started fleshing it out a little bit. But I wanted to give you three quotes. It's a Christian lady from the 30s I'm researching. She ended up being a missionary. She had a pretty tough struggle, and it's really an interesting story of faith and courage. But um, her name is Gladys Alliward. Ward. A-L-Y-W-A-R-D, Alloward. Here's the first quote. Oh God, here is my Bible. Here is my money. Here is me. Use me, God. How many of us have said that? This is my Bible. This is my money. This is me. Use me. The second quote. Here I was worrying about my journey while God was helping me all the way. I made me realize that I am very weak, my courage is only borrowed from him, but oh, the peace that flooded my soul. Because I knew that he never failed. I would not, if I could, turn back now. Because I believe that God is going to reveal himself in a wonderful way. Now, this is a fairly young woman at this time. She died in 1970, but this is 1932. She was responsible for saving many lives. But that's part of the rest of the story. Here's the third quote. I wasn't God's first choice for what I've done in China. She was a missionary in China. I don't know who it was. It must have been a man, a well-educated man. I don't know what happened. Perhaps he died. Perhaps he wasn't willing. And God looked down. And God saw 
Gladys. And God said, well, she's willing. That was all it took. Folks, you have to be willing. You've got to be willing. You don't do it for any reason other than to bring comfort to the man of God or to help people. You don't look for acclamations. She didn't get a lot of presidential medals back then. She didn't get anything. I just stumbled across her story. Never heard of her in my life. I'm going to get to know her a little bit better. It's those amazing things right there that God rewards. We have to be willing. If we're not willing, God will not use us. He will not force us. He will not compel us. We have the freedom of choice. We have the freedom to serve or not serve. We have the freedom to believe or not believe. We have the freedom to honor God or not. I say whatever the circumstances, I know, I know some of them in some of your lives, you know some of the things in my lives, but I say if the circumstances in our lives can cause us not to praise God, we need to readjust our thinking and realize that we're weak we don't have courage except what comes from God. And then we need to submit to God in everything. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for these words. I thank you for these missionaries. I thank you for the, the Shumanite. And the, I thank you for your prophets, Father. I thank you for a wise king. I thank you for leaders that make good decisions, Father. Father, I thank you most of all for your grace and your love. For saving for saving a warm like I. For saving someone. Father, we talk about your sense of humor and how you use different people. The, this wonderful missionary lady said she wasn't God's first choice. I have a very hard time believing I was the first choice of yours either, Father. But I share what she shared. I was willing. Father, I ask that you just strengthen me, strengthen this ministry, strengthen this church, strengthen this congregation, strengthen everyone that hears these words. Your words, Father. Your holy scriptures. As you told the story of this wonderful, willing servant of yours. Father, I ask that in the name, the name of my Master. I just want to be a grateful servant, Father. I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.